uh, welcome if this is your first time. And uh, <clears throat> so normally, if this is your first time, we have a lecture. And then after lecture, there's a Q&A discussion. And if you'd like to meet the um, speaker, we, in the back, we have some guests. We have some refreshments. So let's begin with the chant. If you know the chant, just chant along. Om Asato Ma Sadgamaya Tamaso Ma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityor Ma Amritam Gamaya Avir Avir Maiti Sutrayate Dakshinam Mukham Te Namam Pahinityam Te Namam Pahinityam Om Shanti 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 Lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness to light. Lead us from death to immortality. O oh Lord, guide us through and through and ever protect us with thy loving presence. Om Peace, Peace, Peace to all beings everywhere. Well, today we have a special treat. We have our guest speaker, Dr. Timal Sina. I think most everybody knows him. He's been speaking here quite frequently at the Vedanta Society. Today, his topic will be on Vedanta and Tantra, the confluence between both, the intersection between both. So these are two vast subjects, Vedanta and Tantra. And... Um, when I first told him about doing this talk, we thought one session would be enough, but it's a very vast. So what we decided to do is break this talk into two sections. So today will be the first part, and then in February, we will have the second part. So Dr. Timal Sina. Thank you, Swamiji. Namaskar. <laughs> Vishwam Darpan Adrishyaman Nagari Tulyam Nijam Targatam Persian Nath Mani Maya Bahiri Vod Bhutam Yatha Nidraya Yasakshat Gurute Prabhu de Samaye Swatmana Mevadvayam Tasme Sri Guru Murtaye Namajidam Sri Dakshina Murtaye The Guru Lord Shiva in the form of Dakshina Murti. recognizes his own glory, manifest as if in the mirror, the things within being as if outside. The world and the consciousness recognizing as one. When Swamiji asked me, I immediately said yes. I have often always said yes, mm -hmm. uh, depending on time constraints, of course. This is the place for this type of conversation, a confluence between Vedanta and Tantra. Why? For me, this is a Ramakrishna mission, not a Vedanta mission. Sorry, it's okay. There is a difference between Ramakrishna mission and Vedanta mission. Ramakrishna mission is the confluence of Vedanta and Tantra. The life of Ramakrishna is the confluence of Vedanta and Tantra. He is an embodiment of the recognition of the Brahman and Kali. And that is why I thought this is an appropriate topic for us to discuss today. 
So I will break down some of the misconceptions we have, and I'll try to maybe revise some of these things that we can trace back. And then I'm longing, you know, actually for that type of history, that type of antiquity in which we could go back to these original receipts and capture some glimpses of their primordial experiences that has sapped this, all the literature of Bharata Barsa and all the spiritual forms every single stream of philosophy woven within the experience, within the very rubric of the experience of these rishis. And within that context, we have to recognize the confluence, or if there is not a possibility, if I'm stretching too far, I'll give enough time for our question and answer. So this is an open forum. First, when you hear Vedanta, the, the things that come immediately is what Vedanta says, is the world is illusion, the world is not real. And when you hear Vedanta, another thing you immediately say, this is the uh, continuity of the Veda, this is the Vedic path versus the Tantra, the other outside path. This follows the Veda. That is the second thing. And three, this teaches Advaita, non-duality. Let me tell you, all these are misnomers. Number one, Vedanta, we understand today, has been synonymous to the teachings of Shankaracharya, and there are so many different Vedantas. And so if we conclude that the Vedanta teaches the world as a Maya, we are only following one particular commentarial tradition upon Vedanta. What is Vedanta then? Vedanta is the Upanishad. Veda, and I'm on to the end of the Vedas. Vedanta means Upanishads and how to read the Upanishads. And that has been a perplexing issue for the last 2000 years. Many, many, many commentarial traditions have come. So the number one was itself a misnomer. <clears throat> And two, of course, uh, the oneness also, that is debatable because there are texts where it appears to not directly teaching a singularity. And of course, I would lean to the non-dual teaching that is my Guru Parampara, but I do not flat out discredit so many other uh, dualist and dualist and non-dual type commentarial traditions within Vedanta. So this is a broader topic, that is my point. So we should not immediately, when we are trying to map two systems, we have to see whether we have understood these two categories. Otherwise, we will be making all the wrong uh, uh, stereotypes and we want to save ourselves from that. And when we think of Tantra, again, what do we do? O Tantra is a, uh, this is um, a, a drinking and sex party. Again, how much of Tantric philosophies we have tried to understand? How, may, how much of Agamas we have tried to read? And how many sadhana practices had we explored or exercised? So, when we think of tantras, we need to, just like in the case of Vedanta, I said these are the Upanishads, in the case of tantra, we have to go back to the original agamas. And then we do not have one or two, but 92 agamas, the 64 non-dual Bhairava agamas, 10 dualistic Shaiva agamas, 18 dualistic and non-dual Veda Aveda, Rodra agamas. And so this is not again a single philosophy. Just like in the case of Vedanta, it would be wrong to say it teaches only non dualism, even though I do prefer only a non dual reading, maybe 
in the case of Tantra also, but again, it is a misnomer to go and say that Tantra is through and through non-dual. So my first point has been to share with you that we have a vast amount of literature. And when we jump into making some comparisons, we may be making some blunders and we need to save ourselves from that. I'm also a little relaxed today because Swamiji gave like another hour to talk on another time. So I'm not just uh, uh, jumping into much of a later developments because I, I, I don't want to go into too many texts. Still, I would like to nonetheless show a very useful book a Brahma Sutra with the, the commentary of Shankara. This is the book, the commentary I have read or try to read more closely than honestly other commentaries. And I still believe that Shankara's commentary without any uh, embarrassment, I say is the only true commentary, okay? So uh, uh, if somebody feels offense there, I'm sorry. Um, but what is this? Brahma Sutra, because talking about Vedanta, I need to, I needed to bring that uh, into conversation. Brahma Sutra, this is the book original Brahma Sutra is not this long. It's like one Sutra is like sometimes one line, sometimes just two words. And there's just 555 sutras. And you could have that in five pages or 10 pages, you know. And so the rest is a commentary. But these Brahma Sutras of Badarayana are trying to weave all the Upanishadic teachings to systematize the teachings found in the Upanishads, to give a coherent narrative because Upanishads are not the teachings of one person, one Rishi. There are many, many Upanishads and many teachers. The, the, at least the Upanishads cited most likely referred in the Brahma Sutra itself who go to 12 or 13 Upanishads, including like 10 principal Upanishads and Svetashvatara, Mahanarayana Upanishad, Kaushitaki. So these Upanishads we need to add within the 10 principal Upanishads. This is what is Vedanta. And why was it necessary to make a coherent structure of all these teachings? Is because, let me see, Ishavasya Upanishad. Aneja dekam manaso javiyo naina deva prapnan puramasata dhavato nyana teki deshvata sinna nako matari shvata dhati tad. Uh, aneja de ekam, there is this one absolute singular reality that does not move, that is motionless. I think verse number four or five, and then the next verse. Tad eja ti taneja ti taduri tadu antike. That moves, that absolute is dynamic and is also motionless at the same time. Okay, you can, can you see the contradiction there between these two statements? That is why we needed some type of coherence. And if it's, a, it's a, I'm talking from a single book, but if you start comparing other Upanishads, then you are gonna find this even more chaotic. And therefore, in the Brahma Sutra, we have four chapters. First is Samanvaya, coherence. The first section is called the section on Samanvaya, coherence. Because if these Upanishads, all the teachings are to be left scattered here, scattered their different teachings, then we are not going to weave them in the form of a rosary, in the form of a garden. Have a singular reality taught through these texts. And so the first chapter, chapter endeavors to weave all of them together and, and weed out contradictions. Aviroda, non-contradiction. When and the, the second section deals with how 
there is no contradiction with multiple other teachings. And that is when we get into different philosophical schools and examine their viewpoints and see how valid or how truthful their positions are. And when I use a term philosophy, you need to really understand the word I'm using in very much like Socratic sense rather than the way philosophy has been abused in our generation. Philosophy is a remedy. Philosophy is a cure of all our sufferings because they, they start from our thoughts. Our problems are rooted in our thinking. And so it is not just about theory. It's, it's not about just making some theories, no matter how bizarre they are, and then throwing some arguments there and debating over it nonsensically and, and having some papers published. These philosophies, I have told elsewhere many times, when we are reading Pashupatas, Nayas, for example, most Pashupatas were the Naya philosophers. Why on earth these ascetics smearing ashes all over their body be doing the sharpest of the logic ever evolved in India? If this logic was not necessary for our spiritual progress, or any other school, you name it, Sankhya, or, or of course, yoga now, everybody says yoga is actually for your upliftment. But the point is, even other schools have come in the same context to explore different possibilities in the quest of our self-realization. And the section on Aviroda does exactly that, to explore the coherence among and tries to synthesize the position of the Upanishads in light of those teachings. Now, the third big section is about sadhana, the instrumentality, the means for the final hull, the realization that is self-realization. Here, just one point I, I must drop and then I'll go to some vidyas because I've come to actually the crux of the math that is the instruments and the result. Many of you who have been doing Vedanta are convinced that uh, we will have uh, by, by listening to some enlightened gurus or maybe Upanishads, then we will have the knowledge. I don't know what that knowledge is. And then that knowledge will grant us liberation. Sadhana and phala. Sadhana is the reading or understanding and phala is the moksha, liberation. Okay, let me, let me uh, 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 ring a, a little wake up call here that uh, the, this type of uh, separation of uh, realization, because knowledge is not something different from realization. And liberation is not something different from realization. So if we are thinking that we will have first an event, we are reading in a very linear order that one event happens and the event follows after that, a very temporal thing. That's how we think. That's how our brain works. We have to have the cause and the effect. That is how we can think, <laughs> doomed to think that way. They say there is no causality for realization. Realization is not a consequence of our effort. Realization is not an effect of our studies or anything. Realization is always there. And so if there is no difference in this self-realization and, and then liberation, that is one and the same thing, I have the jnana and that's all I want. I don't, after jnana, I don't need to go away somewhere. I don't need to save myself from hell. I don't need to get something differently or change my dress or, you know, there is, it's not a cause and effect thing. So this realization, we need to separate 
from the sadhana, sadhana itself, instead of calling jnana, meaning realization as the means and then liberation as an end, let us make a difference. Sadhana as the means as vidya, the esoteric practices that are called upasana. What am I talking about? Let's go back to the Upanishads. If you consult Upanishads, you are going to find more than 50 different vidyas, esoteric sciences or, or wisdoms, wisdom teachings. For example, Dahara Vidya, Bhuma Vidya, Madhu Vidya, Pancha Agni Vidya, or uh, uh, many, many other vidyas like that. Um, uh, and, and Madhu Vidya, for example, uh, you know, Udgita Vidya, for example, these Vidyas. When you read the Upanishads, what they are saying is these Vidyas were handed down from one Rishi to the next. They have a genealogy in different Upanishads of how a particular Vidya was handed down from one Rishi to the next. I am convinced that these were esoteric experiences encapsulated within those words. And later we have simply read as some philosophical statements and have flattened all the experiences in quest of making them into a single nugget of self-realization. In this process, we have gained something, a deep philosophy in this context. We have lost something. All the different experiences of the rishis having unique modes of experiences captured, encapsulated within those vidyas. And then we have almost in the later time tried to subjugate and wipe clean these upasanas, rejecting a direct instrumentality of upasana. You realize, you study, you listen to the word, job done. So there is no real instrumentality of upasana, srotavyo, mantavyo, nididhyasidavya, atma vare drashtavya, when we have this major statement, when in that we find that you need to hear and reflect and need apply. So this, the application aspect, what we have done is white clean in making it a flat Upanishadic thinking as the reflection upon the self or Shakshi Baba or whatever we say. Let us try like a good archeologist to dig out the layers after layers of the teachings of these rishis, the different Vidyas, the Hara Vidya and Bhuma Vidya and what possibly they could be like. And if we are actually willing to do so, then we are actually having a conversation with Tantra, because that is where we are going to find a tremendous commonality. And I know that uh, just like in the case of the Vedanta, there is in, in this Tantric literature, tremendous amount of other things that are not directly related to Pasana or maybe sidewise related to, and I'm not denying there are all these conversations on uh, drinks and sex and all those things, of course, there. But if our quest is to explore these nuggets, we have to be open-minded, just again, like archeologist doesn't pick up every single rock, but goes to actually find and pick whatever the unique thing he's looking for. So if he's a dinosaur bone hunter, he's not going to be excited about every single piece of rock he digs out. So you have to look for what you are looking for. You have to have that type of high strength as a researcher. Then in these tantric literature, the first thing we are going to find is cosmology. 
lengthy, lengthy cosmology. And those cosmologies are mapped within our own body. All these cosmogonic expressions are experiences of a yogi sitting in meditation, experiencing totality encapsulated within his own being, within his own body, as Gorakshanath teaches uh, in his uh, uh, Siddhanta Paddhati of Pinda, Brahmanda Bada, meaning Pinda, your body is Brahmanda, the totality, the cosmos. When you say Aham Brahma Asmi, and Gorakshanatha teaches Pinda Brahmanda, there is literally no difference because Brahman being the totality and Brahmanda here is being the totality. When the only difference is this aham and we are mapping the egoity in the Upanishadic statement, discrediting our corporeal being, our physical presence. And I think that we have to really reconsider our physical presence in the world, in the spiritual quest. Because I think that as long as we are seeking our unity with some absolute in negation of our physical presence, we may be misreading the Upanishadic ethos, not just because it is time for our generation to rethink the body or our physical presence, but if you read Upanishads, I have also published some articles uh, that the books talk about the gods having no chance of liberation. They have to come back and become human. And then the question comes, why on earth gods are less uh, privileged than the humans? Because gods don't have our type of body. They have the Atibahika body. And in that body, they cannot have that realization. We have doomed our emotional being. We have discredited our physical presence in reading the Upanishads. And what we have been telling is the whole question is only of the inner ego, this aham, and mapping that ego with some absolute Brahman. What if this mapping has to begin from our Annamaya? Bhrigur vai varuni varudam pitaram upasasara adihi bhagavo brahmeti saho vacha tapasaviji gyasasva satapastepe tapastep tapta annam brahmeti vajanat anna deva khalu imani bhutani jayante annena jatani jivanti annam prayanti avisham vishanti what we are reading is, let us say, I'm, I'm, I'm making a tantric claim by not reading Tantra, but, but reading Upanishads. What this statement is saying is uh, this Varuni is getting through these experiences in which he first encounters that Anna is the Brahman. The food is the Brahman. Our Anna Maya Kosha, our physical flesh body is the Brahman. It would go deeper than this. And then he goes deeper and you already know Manomaya, Pranamaya, Vigyanamaya, all these koshas. I'm not going to repeat all the Vedanta today. But the point being, when you start thinking, just let's take an example of Pranamaya. Could Brigo actually think upon prana in negation of anna? Can you actually experience your pranic existence? When you are meditating, just think clearly, really clear-headedly. Can you really get to your pranic existence in a total negation of your physical presence? Is it logically possible for us to have a pranic being in absence of our physical being? Yes, there is subtlety in prana. That is, I agree to that. And that is what the Upanishad is saying. That it is not saying, hey, you have to just completely discredit this flesh so that you can get to prana. You will die and you won't even have prana, okay? 
So don't, don't do that. <laughs> so then the same applies to manas, the mind. Yes, that's more exotic. But if you do not have prana, you are a dead body. You don't have the mind functioning in your body. Just forget your meditation. So therefore, the pancha kosha vidya is not a successive process of negation to go to the absolute uh, anandamaya. The Panchakosha Vidya is a gradual progression from starting recognizing what you can, any idiot can understand the body, give him food, he will enjoy. Birds enjoy food, animals enjoy food. You know who enjoys food? My plants enjoy food. So recognition of our Annamaya Kosha is not so difficult. In that recognition, what is being asked is to recognize our pranic existence and is to recognize in that process the deeper layers of our being of manas, the mind, and vijjana, cognition, and ananda, the bliss. So, if our realization is the recognition of the totality, not in negation of our physicality or pranic existence, but rather embracing everything within in this awakening, not just that your mind wakes up to some transcendent reality, your body rejuvenates with the joyous of your presence in this bliss. And that to me is where I find identity between Vedanta and Tantra. And so we can get start mapping from other vidyas like the Hara Vidya, the Vidya of recognizing this empty space in your heart. Now go to the discourse of the Hara Vidya faithfully without any blindness and then read the Vijayana Bhairava Tantra. Is there a real categorical difference between what is being taught to go into this empty space in the heart and what Vijana Bhairava teaches you to recognize emptiness? Yes. So that is where, uh, that is what I'm talking about, that these type of vidyas are maybe presented in a different form in the Agamic literature, and we may have a better luck to reconstitute the original experiences of the rishis, the original vidyas. If we start uniting and reading comparatively these different vidyas rather than discrediting one at the cost of the next. So, Udgita Vidya, from Chandogya to many Upanishads do stress on Udgita. What is Udgita? Pranav, the Om. In this triadic structure, we find particularly epitomized in the teachings of Mandukya, Upanishad, and then, of course, in Mandukya, Kariya. What is this triadic structure first? A, U, and Ma, and then mapping with the waking, dreaming, and deep sleep consciousness going to the transcendent, to the state of consciousness. Now, the triadic structure is at the core of the Tripura Sadhana, Tripura Vidya, Tripura Sundari Vidya, which you worship in Sri Yantra in the triangular structure of nine intersecting triangles of four and five considered Shakti and Shiva triangles. And through and through, if you read the text like Yogini Ridayam, what you are going to find is a deeper analysis of the triadic states of our being again, rather than rejecting these three states for the sake of the four. We want to go to four, to three states, the four, we want to forget all these three. No, you can have the fourth while also having all these three. Trishu Chaturtham, Tailavad Asetyam, Shiva Sutra teaches us that in these all three states, the fourth state is soaking like oil, soaking your cloth, for example. So actually with Gita Vidya, oh, this is in the re recognize the world in the triadic structure. That is the statement we get. But if you want to recognize that, 
what is the method. Then we have the Tripura Vidya. Or if you want to go to Bhuma Vidya, an, an experience of the infinity. Nowhere is an elaborate form of this Bhuma expansion of our presence as in the tantric nasas of these 118 or 224 governors really graphically presented. You do NASA installation and different bodies and go mapping within your body the totality. So endless expansion is thought. So my point is if we have, when we are doing Vedanta these days, simply we are reading and we are thinking, I'm not saying we are brainlessly reading, but we have, as if forgotten the upasana part, that every vidya came in the context of upasana. And these upasana survived in maybe different forms in another. These people who were composing agamas didn't come from another planet. They were sapped with the same cultural ethos and reading the same philosophies. And when they were writing these esoteric practices, my argument is they were systematizing some of the experiences of these different rishis found in the Upanishadic teachings. Pancha Agni Vidya. So this, in the Upanishads, you get this Agni Vidya. In Tantra, we have uh, these, these uh, uh, manas, the mental Agni Hotra. Or the likewise, prana vidya, the wisdom of prana found explicitly in the Upanishads. If you read the texts like uh, Sri Tantra Loka of Avinava Gupta, you will find to the depth elaborated exercise of prana in, in meticulous, Swatsandha Tantra, for example, a meticulous mapping of the pranic flow from a minuscule of time and in minuscule of space mapped within your own body. The same goes to Madhu Vidya, the Vidya of Ananda, the bliss Madhu, everything in the world transforming into joyous mode of our experience. Jayanti Jagadananda Vipaksha Kshapanakshama Paramesha Mukhod Bhuta Jnana Chandra Maricha Malini Vijaya Tantra begins with the very invocation of Jagadananda. The type of surge of bliss that encapsulates the totality. The type of experience in euphoria, a surge, a splash of ananda where we transcend our corporeal experiences, our pranic flows, pranic experiences, and, and, and the mind cannot fathom it. It is stupefied because mind can only capture to a certain extent. And these inner blissful modes are so powerful. And sometimes, if you ever have any of these sorts of Kundalini experiences, you would know what I'm referring to. Because the, the best the physical experience one can have is in the uh, 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 Vishaya Ananda. I'm not making up. This is Vidyarana Swami, Vishaya Ananda Prakaran and Panchadashi. What is the best of Trishukha? Experiencing coupling. Oh my gosh, that is not Vedanta. Okay, don't read them. Go to Brihadaranyaka, you know, you'll find more graphic detail of, of all the arani, the, 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 the friction, you know, depicted of like a two um, woods, you know, and then how the fire comes through friction and all that depiction. <laughs> Unfortunately, I found one of the Swamis translated that and then he just omitted that from the Upanishadic translation because it went little graphic for him, you know. So sorry about it. So the, the idea is that if we were to read the Upanishads, these are the texts written by sincere people trying to actually discuss those experiences, starting from the experiences that we know. What is the experience we know well? 
if you have ever eaten good food and enjoyed, uh, and, and then you would know something more than nutrition is possible. I know many of the spiritual people I've been in company with, they think that enjoying good food is for like a layman, everybody. And if you are spiritually minded, then you should not be looking for your tongue, you know, to satisfy uh, these things. So this is to me is the worst possible decadence and degradation of Vedanta. You should enjoy the world. That would be the proper recognition of Vedanta. Then and then that is it. Uh, when Vijnana Bhairava says three sukhats of Aratsamrite, when you have this list in coupling, and then so there is there is not really something to be scared about. I know some people who are physically handicapped, and I I I I, I beg their forgiveness because I'm not saying they can't have the Brahman experience without going through all these. But the people who are able to, you know, if the text do not say it is uh, inapplicable. The text actually are starting, but that is not the goal though. That is where we make a mistake. That's, that's the beginning. That's the first step. So, and why that experience was necessary? It's a metaphor, not a goal. Why, why, that, why we had to pick up that? is because if you have the source of Kundalini experiences and your entire body tingles, what other experience would be there to map that tingle experience? When you do not have a particular location in your body, but your entire corporeality becomes the site for exuberance, becomes the, becomes the expression of joyance. And what do you use for that metaphor? We needed that. The same goes to uh, Sora Sakala. There is this multiple Upanishads, including Kaushitaki or uh, Brihadaranyaka, Sora Sakala the, in the Purusha, mapping 16 Kalas, 16 aspects, the totality mapped in 16 digits. And like in the lunar phase, uh, the 15 digits of the moon and then the 16th Amakala. And so totality expressed in 16 categories. This is repeatedly expressed in the Upanishads. Let me tell you, in Tantra, we call Shodashi the 16th Vidya. And then we have this Panchadashi, the 15 divinities starting from Kameshwari, Bhagamalini, Nithiklina, Verunda, Banivasini, Mahavajreshwari, Shivaduti, Tarita. And uh, so this, this order are actually referring to a gradual progression, just like in the lunar phase, the, it, the light gradually progresses the same way. Your joyous, blissful awakening or the source of your Kundalini gradually moves onward and you are led to higher and higher states because most people, they get some, you know, some people have just claimed self-realization by just hiking a little bit up and feel great. Oh my gosh, I'm enlightened. Because there are grades. When you have nothing, when you enter into a Sampragyata state, when you are in that pure bliss state and no object there, no ego there, no subject there, then you have the right to say you are totally enlightened. You got that, you got there. That is the first stage. That is the point of Sorsha Kala. Go through 16 gradual progression onward. And then instead of, instead of when you are stupefied by one single flash of experience, try to develop, that is where Sakshi Baba comes to play. And we have to borrow Vedanta to help understand Tantra so that you can transcend, you can objectify even that stupefication of yourself. And then you gradually go from one layer of that source of bliss and singularity experience to the higher and higher states of experiences. And so this is how I'm trying to read. What I mean by this is read the Upanishads with the stress on um, sadhana, the means, rather than the goal. Because our reading so far has been to talk about the ultimate result. This is the Brahman, we realize it, we get it. This is the follow, the goal. 
And what is that state like? We are describing that state on and on. And this is the a, a, a type of children talking about what they should not. So you know what I mean? It's like not, not gradually progressing to experience, but then copying some experiences from a book, like a, a graphic novel or something, and then trying to understand the meaning while you are under age. That is obscene. So the, if you want to really understand the book, then you have to evolve, grow aging. Not I'm talking about age-wise here, but how to age, how to grow through sadhana, of course. Because as long as there is no real deep sadhana, there is no growth inward. And that is where I would like to come back again to Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. This is not just phala. A, a sort of a conclusion of Vedanta that you see he, that he embodied, but you also see sadhana, worshipping Mother Kali. That is the sadhana. And that is where we find the confluence of Vedanta and Tantra. So let me stop here. So I'm not doing a monologue and I welcome you guys to have questions. <laughs>